at sunrise. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for waking up with us to start your Saturday. I'm Maggie Vespa and topping headlines this morning. A Salem man searches for his car with his father's ashes inside, both stolen from his driveway right before Christmas. Plus, a startling report detailing sexual harassment at the Oregon State Capitol and the failure to support accusers. But before we get to all of that, Vanessa Paz is standing by on this Saturday morning with a check of the forecast. Hey, Vanessa. Good morning, Maggie, and welcome to the first weekend of January 2019, everyone. It's going to be a pretty active one, at least in the weather department. Right now, as we take a live look, though, at our Doppler radar, you can tell that we're dry pretty much everywhere. So if you want to go for a run right now would be the perfect time to do so because things are going to change pretty dramatically as we progress through your Saturday. Right now, current temperatures along the uh, Timberline Lodge here, 29 degrees, and uh, winds right now are pretty calm. They are going to change significantly as we progress through the day as we have a uh, wind watch and a wind advisory in uh, from the coastline to inland. I'll get more into that in my full forecast, but here's what your weekend forecast looks like. We're going to start off things pretty foggy and then towards the afternoon we're going to see spotty rain, but highs are going to remain in the mid to upper 40s tomorrow. Also staying in the mid 40s with showers continuing and a thunderstorms chance. Some or a lot of things rather are happening overnight, though. We're talking about high winds, especially here in the valley. I will explain all of that later on in my full forecast. Maggie. All right, Vanessa, sounds good. Thank you. We'll see you soon. In the meantime, our top story this morning, a wild night in Aloha. Police say a driver hit a woman and then took off. This happened around 5 o'clock near 185th and Farmington. Turns out, though, the driver didn't get far. Police say he slammed into another car, then a fence. And that is where an off-duty Clackamas County Sheriff's deputy got involved in all of this. We're told he saw the hit and run, and he followed the car. Once the driver hit the fence, the off-duty deputy pinned him there until help could arrive. People fly up and down this street all the time, and um, I have seen um, drunk drivers and whatnot, but never anything like this. Well, we just paid off our car like two months ago, <laughs> and we've never had an accident with it. This has been our baby, and now that it's paid off, it's totaled. Oh, you just heard for him. So that second woman you just heard from there was behind the wheel of a car hit by the driver. She said she hurt her knee, but she should be fine. As for the pedestrian, that woman who was hit, she should also be okay, thankfully. Well, this morning, a Salem man is hoping you can help him track down his stolen car, especially because there's something very special inside. Chris Wigginton says he walked out of his house the night before Christmas Eve and realized his car had been stolen. Even worse, inside the glove box, his late father's ashes. Wigginton said the two shared a love of cars and he feels close to his dad by keeping the ashes inside his car. Cars are replaceable. I mean, diamond dozen nowadays, um, but my father's irreplaceable. I, I just wish that I could get that piece back. That's all I asked for. All right, so for reference, there it is. Chris's car is a black 1993 Honda Civic. It was stolen from his driveway along Norway Street Northeast. Anyone with information is encouraged to contact the Salem Police Department. Well, now to the revelations rocking Oregon's capital this morning and a new report that seems to reveal a culture of sexual harassment in Salem with little being done to stop it. Several women have said that you made them uncomfortable, you continued to harass them. No comment. This clip from early 2018 highlights the case at the center of the new report. It shows now former state senator Jeff Cruz dodging mounting accusations of sexual harassment, including those from state senator Sarah Gelser. This is supposed to be a harassment free workplace. It is supposed to be safe for everyone. Among her accusations, Gelser said Cruz on separate occasions touched her breasts and her thigh. Cruz eventually resigned. This week's 52-page Bureau of Labor and Industries report calls Gelser credible and details responses from legislative leaders. The report claims House Speaker Tina Kotek told Gelser it would be hard to move forward with her complaints because people found her unlikable. In another incident, investigators say Senate President Peter Courtney yelled at Gelser while discussing the harassment in a cafe. He reportedly later apologized. In a statement, Courtney said, I have 
never knowingly allowed harassment to go on. I have taken severe actions beyond my authority to stop it. Kotek on Facebook confirmed the story about her conversation with Gelser, writing, quote, I deeply regret that I hurt Senator Gelser or made her feel less supported. She then added she vehemently disagrees with a number of conclusions in the report. Then there were the accusations outside the Cruz case. The report alleges State Representative David Gomberg asked for birthday spankings from interns and joked about one being a stripper. It also says Representative Bill Post touched a female staffer's leg at a bar and texted her that his wife was out of town. Post denied the accusations via email. Gomberg has yet to respond to our inquiries. An attorney hired by the legislature called the report biased. I think this report, frankly, is rather replete with omissions of, of things that they know uh, because I sat in on many of the interviews they did. In fact, 10 of the interviews they did I sat in on. Uh, and the information that's necessary to make a final determination on how do we go forward was simply left out of the report. All right, so what happens now? That is up to Oregon's next labor commissioner. The current one who oversaw that investigation, Brad Avakian, had his last day yesterday. His successor, Val Hoyle, is being sworn in on Monday, and she told us in a statement she will start looking into that report right away. And at the same time, Governor Kate Brown is talking about the issue as well on this week's edition of Straight Talk. She calls the report concerning and says harassment of any kind is unacceptable. The governor tells us state leadership is working to implement an office of equity so people who are being harassed can have a safe place and confidential place to get help. It is very, very concerning and I need to be very, very clear. Sexual harassment, harassment of any kind in the workplace, whether it's in the Capitol or in our courtrooms or in our classrooms is absolutely unacceptable. Now, the governor added employees in her office went through harassment training last year, and she is working to make sure all state agencies have consistent policies in place to deal with workplace harassment. You can watch Laurel's entire interview with Governor Brown this afternoon at 4.30. We have a health alert for you this morning. There have now been two confirmed cases of measles in Oregon and Washington. In fact, the Oregon Health Authority tells us one of the infected people spent time in the Dalles and Hood River. In fact, they went to the Discovery Center, the Fred Meyer in the Dalles, and in Hood River, they visited the Full Sail Brewery, the Dopio Cafe, and Goodwill. This happened between December 29th and 30th. And then in Clark County, public health officials say a child contracted measles after traveling outside the country. We're told people who visited Peace Health Urgent Care on Main Street from noon until 5.30 on New Year's Eve, December 31st, may have been exposed. Measles symptoms usually show up within two weeks. Well, if the big one, as it's known, hits, the city says too many buildings will crumble. And for that reason, they're mandating seismic updates for a lot of Portland's oldest structures, including some pretty famous music venues and pubs. And today, several owners of those venues are planning to push back with a protest. They want the city to know seismic upgrades are expensive and they might need to refinance or take out an equity loan on their building to afford them. But they say what the city's asking of them would just make that impossible. The city wants them to sign this contract, promising not to remove placards deeming the buildings unsafe until those upgrades are done. Owners say those placards will make it tough to refinance their buildings. For many, that's the only way they're going to be able to get the funds they need to pay for the upgrades. I don't think that anybody is against increasing safety in any of these buildings. Uh, the point is, is that basically the city has moved forward with a bunch of um, preemptive regulations without speaking to any of the building owners, without speaking to the community at all. So there is a long list of venues that may need seismic upgrades like the Crystal Ballroom, Keller Auditorium and Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall are also on that list. Those, though, are owned by the city. KGW reached out to the city for a response and to, uh, to building owners' concerns. We are now waiting to hear back. That protest will be in front of City Hall at 10 a.m.